Hello and welcome to uh, this afternoon's debate, Trust, Science and Neutrality. From Covid to climate change, we put our trust in science and scientists. Pure research is meant to be neutral and objective. Yet 70% of all research is funded by commercial interests and more than half the remaining is in the pursuit of military objectives. On the one hand, we see science as the gold standard of objective truth. Yet we allow and encourage research to be influenced in its direction by those with powerful vested interests. Can research provide an unbiased and independent account of the world when so much of it is burdened with monetary incentives? Or should we give up the notion that pure research can be objective and welcome innovation, whoever is funding it and for whatever purpose? With me to debate this topic, we have a great panel, three leading scientists, each with direct experience of confronting the issues raised by the debate. Tara Shears is an experimental particle physicist and one of the top British scientists at CERN, where her experiments run on the Large Hadron Collider, the largest particle accelerator in the world. Terence Keeley is a clinical biochemist and former vice chancellor of Buckingham University and an outspoken critic of the government funding of science. And Brett Weinstein is an evolutionary biologist and visiting fellow at Princeton who came to public prominence following his criticism of woke culture at Evergreen State College in Washington in 2017. He's part of a group known as the Intellectual Dark Web and hosts the influential Dark Horse podcast. I'm gonna give each of them three minutes to, to set out their response to the key question that we are seeking to address this evening. Is science unduly biased by money and power? So Tara, it's all yours. Thank you. Well, let, let's unpick that question a little bit because I think it's probably helpful to start off by defining what we mean by science, first of all. It's quite a nebulous phrase. Before we then look at the issue of bias and, and where money and power comes in. So, I am going to define science as the accumulated body of knowledge about the physical universe and, and all the life inside it. And I'm going to define the process of extending this knowledge as research. Now, research proceeds through something called the scientific method, whereby you form hypotheses based on your understanding. You test them by collecting evidence and experiments. You look to see if it matches, if it does. You build up your understanding, you make more predictions, and so on and so on. That, that's the way that research progresses science. And that means to me that science is a body of knowledge that's as unbiased as we can make it. And I, I would argue if it's biased, it's bad science. So we might want to pick up on this later. So Science is not biased, but the process of doing it, provided it's done well, is not biased either. But in the introduction, you raise the issue of trust, of vested interests, of financial incentives, and well, research does proceed by asking questions and hopefully finding answers. And if somebody commissions research, they want an answer given to them, and they're quite clearly influencing the direction that that research is taking. Now. Does that constitute a bias on the science? I would argue not. And it might be biasing the area science is exploring, but not the science itself. But then this wider issue of who pays for research and what they want to know and what they're going to do with that information, and is it ethical, that, that is important. And I still don't think that bias is science, but it is an important question that we should always ask. And that brings up the question of who is best placed to d direct the, um, the direction of science. Should it be by a Haldane principle governed by excellence? Should it be by whoever has money um, who, is, who is actually going to fund it and make it happen? And, you know, and to what ends are they, are they asking their questions and who is going to benefit and how are they going to benefit? When you start overlaying all these other strategic and financial concerns, it gets really complicated. So my very short answer to this question you've asked me is that no, I don't think science is biased. It can't be by my definition, but those who fund it and who commission it may be, not necessarily are, but the potential for bias is there. Thank you, Tara. Terence. Thank you. I, um, I do actually disagree 
quite a lot with Tara, though I think in the end we'll agree. I think the only way you can approach a scientific paper is to assume it's written by someone who is very biased. I think you have to approach each individual scientific paper the way you would approach what a lawyer says in court, uh, in that it is a piece of advocacy. It constitutes what someone wants you to believe is true. You must assume that that person is not telling any lies. I, th I think lying is very, very rare in science. But I think there are all sorts of ways in which individuals who write scientific papers select the data, select their observations, etc., to present a case. Science as a collective, I think ultimately is exactly as Tara has described. It collectively moves forward to the truth, whatever that is, the way judges do about the law. But individual papers and individual scientists believe in particular paradigms that they're pushing. And the rule is you can't lie. But what in practice happens is that scientists, particularly in softer sciences, such as psychology uh, and many of the other softer sciences, as opposed to the physics um, of Tara, uh, select data because it's so easy to select data and are hugely influenced by peer review, which enables them to select the sort of data that will please either their funders or the people who will promote them or the people who publish their papers or the people who will give them grants. And you see whole areas of science, such as nutrition, for example, that collectively go wrong for decades, sometimes in the case of decades. So I agree with Tara that science collectively, like the law collectively, does actually advance to truth. She's obviously right. But individual scientists should be viewed like individual barristers, people who do not tell lies, but who absolutely present a case and only a case. And you, as, a, as reading a scientific paper, have to be very skeptical about each individual paper, even though you can look back on the debates of the 19th century and agree we've now agreed over certain fundamental principles. Thank you, Terence. Brett. Oh, there are interesting points of agreement and disagreement already. I very much agree with Tara that the right way to begin is to define science so we know what we're talking about, but I would define it differently than she does. I would say science is the method that we use and the surrounding context and the body of information that accumulates in science has to be treated differently. They can contain bias, but the method itself is immune to it. In fact, although science is actually an inefficient way of reaching answers, the reason that it has been so ascendant is that it is the only good mechanism we have for correcting for human bias. That is really its purpose. And so the question is, how can we do that? And what happens if we place it in uh, a wider context of private funding? Science does produce a model that increasingly mirrors reality. That is to say, predictive power goes up and the number of assumptions we make must go down and we get a better and better model of reality if science is done correctly. But that very powerful process is also fragile it does not endure market forces well. And Terence is quite right that there is a great deal of advocacy that we see in papers, in grant applications, and in committees that decide what to fund. And therefore, we have to be aware that this process of correcting for human bias, from which we have benefited so greatly, is endangered if we allow it to sit in a context that corrupts it. Now, the discussion is somewhat fraught because when we talk about the possibility of public funding, we are inherently talking about handing over the decision on what to fund to uh, governments that we all recognize are themselves corrupted. So we should separate in this the discussion of whether ideally science must be funded in some public way from the practical consideration of handing those funding decisions to governments that we have good reason not to trust in the present. Thank you all. So lots of, as Brett was pointing out, some really interesting points of contact and dispute here. So the underlying question I'd like to, to address that we start off with is, can research in principle be neutral and unbiased? Um, Terence, you seem to be saying that it's never neutral, that, that scientists are always advocating a point of view. Yes, it's, it was Einstein who said it's theory that determines what we study. 
To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.